Thank you for joining us this evening for tonight's episode of St. Ben's at Home. My name is Marsha Malam, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a St. Ben's alumna from the class of 1996. I'd like to begin our time together this evening by sharing our land acknowledgement. Both the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University occupy the original homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. We honor, respect, and acknowledge the indigenous peoples forcibly removed from this territory, whose connection remains today. St. Benedict's Monastery and St. John's Abbey previously operated boarding schools for native children. Now, students, faculty, and staff are working to repair relationships with our native nations. Thank you. Toward the end of this evening's episode, there will be time for questions. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask Kara or Richard, please click on the ask a question button at the top, at the bottom, excuse me, of your screen to submit your question. Please note, you may need to exit out of full screen view in order to use and ask a question and hit that button. Tonight's session is being recorded and will be posted on our Alum Learning Consortium's past event recordings page in the next one to two business days. Now, please welcome our moderator, Heather Piper Olson, Vice President of Institutional Advancement. Hello and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening for St. Ben's at Home. I'm glad you've all taken an hour out of your lives to join us for a wonderful topic and conversation. Tonight, we welcome back a good friend of St. Ben's at Home, who's familiar with this Zoom format that where we, when we started um, St. Ben's at Home during lockdown, um, Dr. Richard Ice, provost at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, and a brand new guest, who is another relatively new member of the CSB and SJU community, Dr. Kara Kolomets, the Chief Operating Officer. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank so, you. Richard, Kara, how are you doing this evening? Richard, how you doing? Well, I'm doing great. Uh, as maybe some of your audience knows, we had uh, a snow day today. Uh, so classes were all remote and we're uh, digging out. I think we'll be dug out and ready to go for classes to start tomorrow. Kara, how are you doing today? I heard you had a new member of your um, cleanup crew today on campus. We had a new member of our cleanup crew. And I've got to tell you, President Breeze is really good at cleaning up snow. <laughs> he and he and George uh, ran one of the snow plows this morning. So they had a really good time and um, we got some great photos and when it was time for the photos, um, you know, to be done, he said, oh, no, no, I'm finishing this. And he did. <laughs> he cleared the whole parking lot. Um, but yes, we uh, had lots of snow. It's really gorgeous. It's nice to be with you today, Heather. Well, Carol, welcome to St. Ben's at Home. You've been in your position as the Chief Operating Officer for a little over a year now. I can't believe it's gone so fast. And while we've had a chance to get to know you and love you, our audience might not have had the pleasure to know you just yet. So can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and maybe a little bit about what the first year as the inaugural COO has been like? Oh, thank, thank you, Heather. Thank you for that thoughtful question. Um, my husband, Chris, and I um, married almost 20 years. Um, we have a son and a daughter. Our son is 16 and our daughter's 14. Um, and so this is the time in our life where we've agreed that we don't know anything. Um, <laughs> according 16 and a 13 year old. I agree. I know no things. <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, but the last year has been, um, such a fulfilling experience for my entire family. Um, and the warm welcome that I've received, particularly from, um, our alumni has been an unexpected treat. I, um, have had the opportunity to meet many Bennies. And every time I do, it really solidifies the reason why we're here um, and what it means to be a Benny. And um, that welcome that I had within the first year was was very meaningful to me. It's been a busy first year um, and I have um, learned a lot and met a lot of people. Uh, excited to start the second year. 
So this role of COO is really new for the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. That's right. Um, and you've served in it before. Um, yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about sort of your previous experience bringing this into the role and then how you're using your experience um, and this opportunity to shape the missions of St. Ben's and St. John's and what should people know about what a COO does? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, Heather. And I've had a lot of um, very frank questions like, oh, hello, I'm the COO. And oh, really, what do you do? Um, and it's usually said just about that gently. <laughs> um, I am proud to, to be the inaugural COO of the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Um, my previous role at a small school outside of Boston was as the Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. So it's a, a role that I know well um, and that I really believe in for the efficacy of the institution and for um, an in institution to be able to thrive. A COO isn't something that has always been known um, in higher ed. Certainly the C-suite is something uh, talked about in business, but in, in higher ed, it's becoming really the norm to have a COO on campus. Um, presidents have a lot of external facing matters and um, connections that they need to focus on, and somebody needs to be on those campuses and um, making sure that the operation uh, really hums and, and really works. I think that the board felt strongly about um, the model of a COO and a provost because of the work around strong integration, um, really asking us to consider efficiencies with one another, um, to really think about collaborations in a sophisticated way, and um, being able to be a little bit more nimble, reactive, lots of disruptions in the higher ed market right now, and um, making sure that we are fiscally and operationally um, really doing the best work and um, adhere to best practices in higher ed. So I can attest that it is really helpful to have a COO as Brian, Rob Culligan, and I have been traveling this last month. We've been in the Bahamas, we've been in Naples and in Scottsdale. And I know that um, as, you know, it, it allows him to be able to be um, traveling, meeting donors, engaging. He was at the Capitol the night before we left one time. So it really has allowed for us to continue to bring strong integration to life. Um, as, you know, as he continues to connect with and bring St. Ben's um, out to others the way we do here in this as well. So, um, you know, Brian did a great job laying the foundation um, when he was here last fall. Um, he told us about all the listening sessions that you helped engage with, Kara. Um, there was an epic road tour that he went on, 18, um, 18 locations to gather information and intense data collection that went into building and creating the strategic plan. So let's, but let's do just a teeny little memory enhancer um, for those who maybe forgot or um, those who maybe didn't check our, our fall episode out. Um, so Richard, what's the difference about this, with this strategic plan compared to other strategic plans in the past at St. Ben's and St. John? Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Heather. Um, oh. I, I would like to say that like so much with strong integration and everything, there's been a, a, a strong evolution in how we've changed uh, the plans and how we've approached them. Uh, probably about 15 years ago, we started putting together plans that were joint, but at that time, it, they might have been more parallel than, uh, than joint. Uh, the last couple of strategic plans have been joint plans, but they've had joint initiatives and individual ones as as well. And even though the most recent plan, Strategic Directions 2020, was wholly joint, I wouldn't say it was integrated. It wasn't integrated with the approach or with the resources uh, that we were using to, to implement the plan. Right now, we are, are doing this in a wholly integrated way and in a way that is very different in looking at the initiatives by making sure that, that all of the initiatives are, are 
interacting with one another and that they're not standing on on their own. So that's something that's very new. The alums who are joining us may have heard uh, President Brees refer to this plan as a rolling plan. So unlike the past plans that had a five year time frame, this one is more ongoing and more rolling. And that means that doesn't mean that we're just taking it as it comes. We will have benchmarks and we will have timelines, but those timelines are more flexible as we are, are rolling through the uh, initiatives. And we may find that some initiatives are taking longer, some initiatives we can we can accomplish uh, more quickly. You also mentioned all of the input. I think that this plan has had more input and more broad-based input than any of the other plans. And another focus that we have is on key performance indicators. We're going to focus on uh, plan-wide key performance indicators, making sure that those key performance indicators are what are driving the initiatives. For example, one of the key performance indicators that we know we, we need to focus on is uh, student enrollment. And certainly when we're looking at some of the uh, initiatives in the student experience, we're always coming back to the question of how does this initiative and the decisions we're making uh, help us with our enrollment, either with new student enrollment or with retention of current students. So uh, a lot of different uh, uh, things going on with this plan that we've had in the, in the past. So the first thing I'm just going to stop for one second, let you both know that we are having broadcasting issues, but we are recording. So we're going to keep going because um, this link is shared with everyone. So we're going to keep going. Hopefully we'll get this live um, and ongoing, but I don't want to, I want to keep rolling. Is that okay with you too? All right, let's yes. do it. Okay. So let's get really specific. Kara, yes. um, let's, why don't you tell us a little bit about exactly what this plan looks like? Are there pillars, directions, tactics, initiatives? How is this plan organized and laid out? Describe <laughs> all of it. <laughs> I most certainly will. I'm I'm laughing and Richard can attest to this. Um, this was a very um, hotly contested conversation. Are we having pillars, directions, circles? Um, <laughs> and it, it, is, it is something that I have um, really loved about being new at, at CSV uh, and SJU. People have a lot of investment and they have a lot of ideas. And um, I see that as really beneficial. It means that they're invested. It means that they care. And um, they certainly did in terms of how we were going to organize this plan. We had so much data. Um, we had an entire summer that we needed to code the data. So we knew in advance that we were going to have to be very organized and very structured um, to A, include everyone who wanted to be included, um, but B, to, to really track um, our progress and the ideas um, that had come from, from the community at large. We ended up um, with directions. So we have the three large uh, directions, um, which I really do love just the idea of um, looking forward, of um, having intention and um, coalescing together. So, so the idea of directions really um, was, was fitting for us. Our three strategic directions, the first is uh, mission-centered practice, and, and that is really intentional focus around our missions, um, around the, the mission as it lives today, um, ensuring the mission lives tomorrow, and ensuring that our current contemporary student body um, understands the missions in a way that resonate with them. Our second strategic direction is fiscal and operational excellence, um, which I means saves. just that everyone's favorite. I have to say, I I know I'm biased, um, but the, the excellence in 
knowing that our institutions are not just existing, not just getting by, we're thriving. Um, we are known for the best practice in the industry, um, that we are doing our very best to be ahead of the disruptors in higher ed. And we're doing all that, really conserving our resources and being being wise about the way um, we use our, our resources. And uh, lastly, the focal point um, around the third direction is an optimal student experience. And that student experience is all encompassing. It's not um, what is in the classroom and it's not what's on the court or in the swimming pool, or it's not what is in the residence hall. It's all of that. It's every experience that we are offering our young minds and hearts uh, to engage in, um, to really experience what it means to be a Benny. I think what I will say is I, I agree that directions was the right choice. I will say I didn't have an investment in any of that, but I think partly for what Richard said, what makes this difference is the fact that it's rolling. This is where we're heading, but we're not, it's not a stake in the ground in a way that leaves us stagnant. It means we can keep moving as we keep going and as we learn more, which I think is so key to what we're really trying to accomplish here. Agreed. So Richard, um, would you please name and briefly describe a few of the specific initi initiatives that are in the plan? Yes, uh, Kara explained that there were uh, three directions that we have, and there are uh, 13 uh, initiative areas. Um, and, and I would just cover a couple of those. I don't want to cover all 13. Uh, <laughs> but one in the student experience that is, uh, I think, an innovative way of looking at, at some of the issues in higher education is belonging and community through uh, mental health support. We know that nationally, uh, student mental health and mental health support is a key issue on campuses uh, all around the country. Uh, we also know that uh, this is a very important aspect of the student experience and making sure that students are able to successfully complete their education. Now, we are going to uh, use education inside and outside the classroom, developing new systems with intentional enhanced structures to help us be uh, inclusive and to help students to find the appropriate help that they would need uh, and, and helping everybody in the community realize that they are part of this process for our students. Also, this particular uh, initiative is going to serve as our Higher Learning Commission, which is our uh, accrediting agency, mm -hmm. quality initiative, which we have to do a study of, uh, to show uh, improvements uh, around the campus. And I think we can become a leader uh, in the nation on this. Residential experience is, is another uh, innovation uh, that we're, we're looking at. Uh, Tara mentioned that it's the holistic approach and the residential experience is looking at making sure that we have a sophisticated, inclusive and comprehensive and compelling residential experience for our students. We know that for recruitment, retention and for student learning, we have to have a distinctive, impactful and fun residential experience. And we have a team pulling together uh, all kinds of uh, sub initiatives to help uh, identify those. And students are involved in that as well. Uh, DEIJ is a key area and that's part of our uh, mission practice. Uh, we're developing a compelling framework uh, around that. Our uh, senior diversity officer, Sandra Mitchell, has uh, already put together a strategic plan for DEIJ. And this particular uh, initiative isn't separated and isolated. It's woven through all of the initiatives. Mm -hmm. And I know, for example, Sandra is part of the discussion with the key performance indicators to make sure that all the key performance indicators are also looking at who the students that are being left behind are being left behind and what their demographics are and how we can and help them. Strategic enrollment plan is an initiative, and we'll be work, working together with the student experience area and the strategic enrollment group 
to identify uh, strategic graduate programs, strategic new undergraduate programs, uh, strategic um, uh, certificate programs that we might be looking at, as well as some of the co-curricular activities. And then one final one I would point out is the employee experience. Uh, our employees are the most valuable asset that we have. And we want to make sure that we can support and help develop our employees in an ongoing going way. And so we have uh, a particular initiative that is focused on the employee experience, knowing that that also impacts the student experience. That's so great. those are just a few. And it's a really, it's an enormous undertaking. There's so much that we're doing. And, and I will say, you know, what I reflect on, and Kara, I'll let you hop in here too, if there's something you want to share as well. But one of the things I will say is, it really is looking at the things that are so key and core and so true. Our alums will see themselves in this plan, the things that we really truly care about, but in a contemporary way, in a way that has data at its core, that truly understands the hearts and the needs of our students, and also can bring what we what we do alive to those who don't know about us and who consider them as, us as a perspective based for education. So Kara, what are your thoughts on this? Great. Well, I, you know, I, I would say um, the prioritizing of what we do now um, was, I think, probably one of the hardest pieces of this plan and the most essential piece. Um, because for the first time ever, we have two campuses talking about um, what what the future will bring and what the future will hold. And we can't be everything to everybody and we can't do everything on the list. And so really having those hard conversations um, about what is realistic, what is essential and what is strategic. You heard Richard use that word several times. We have to be strategic about um, the programs that we offer, the way we use our resources, the ways in which our mission lives. And so um, I'm I'm probably most proud of that, that there were some really wonderful things that we said, no, it's, it doesn't fit us in terms of mission, or no, that doesn't fit us in terms of what our data says students want. Um, and that's hard for a community to, to have to say no to some good ideas, but but we did it because we're so committed um, to to our future. And I will say um, the the data that came from our alums and our alumni was so um, thoughtful and so impactful. It really mattered for us to to have that and to hear about what their student experience was, what was important to them. Um, we don't want to throw baby out with the bathwater at all. Um, and we wanted to make sure we were honors, honoring all of those real legacy pieces around being a, a Johnny and Benny while emerging innovatively. That's a, you know, that's a hard balance for an institution. Um, I'm, pr I'm proud of the way we've done it in the plan. I agree. I think, you know, even residential life, it's such a, we know that those relationships built in the res halls is so meaningful. But that context is different for students who've never shared a room, um, let alone a bathroom, right? And so many of these things too. So we have to think about how we do this mm -hmm. in a Benedictine, true to St. Ben, St. John's Day for the modern student so that they can also 20 years from now, 25 years from now, 30, 50 years from now, reflect back on that time in the res hall as some of the most meaningful experiences they had here. Our current That's students right. deserve that. That's right. So again, this is a huge undertaking. So Richard, what's been the biggest challenge in preparing and operationalizing a plan like this across two institutions? Yeah, well, I think uh, one of the things uh, Kara hit on very clearly is uh, prioritizing and making choices. Uh, certainly we had to make choices about what was in the plan, but even within the plan, we still have to make choices as we, uh, allocate resources to the different uh, initiatives. And that's difficult. Uh, organizing across both campuses, we've, we've pulled together good teams. Uh, we pulled together teams from across both campuses, from across all different uh, parts of our community. There are students, there are faculty, there are uh, staff members, administrators on, on all of these. Uh, Kara and I meet regularly with 
all of the leaders of the initiatives to make sure that everybody is organized. And, and that I think is going to help us overcome the big challenge of making sure that we're organized and focused on those key performance indicators by keeping the lines of communication open between all of the leaders of the various initiatives and making sure everybody knows the direction that, that we're headed. And I can attest. So I'm actually leading partnerships and community engagement as an initiative. And truthfully, you can't do that without thinking about how it relates to our academic programs or how our students right. live in this community. I mean, we really do have to be um, so connected. And it's been um, so far, we really continue to feel like we're sharing a lot of information. But then we also get to say, how about you focus on that? And I'll focus on this because we know and we trust that we're going to get the kind of outcomes we need. Yeah. So it's yeah. been um, it's been really good to do that as the leadership groups, and then also yeah. within these cross functional teams we built. So Kara, um, you got to pick a favorite or maybe a favorite. So what do you think is the biggest, broadest vision for each of the strategic directions on the plan? It's a full plan, so the full you know, plan. Tell me what it's. Tell me what you think. Um, it's a full really plan. Broad, it's a biggest that thank you for the question i mean that that's a great question um and and i'll just say at the onset that this is this is daunting if you think about having two campuses and solidifying priorities and getting every voice um but the partnership with provost ice has been such a joy for me so i just want to start by saying um working with someone daily um that you you know um has a lot of information about the institution and I don't so I am really grateful for for that partnership I I would say that part of the the reason I'm so proud of our directions they they may sound very general at first pass but there's a lot of meaning behind them um and and how those areas were chosen so for instance I would say around um, mission-centered practice. It is, um, I think, a really modern way to embrace our heritage, our mission, our legacy, and figure out what those practices are on our campus. Um, and, and when I say practice, I mean literally practice. How do we celebrate and honor our mission? How does our mission um, live through the types of vendors that we use? How does our mission live in the curriculum? How does our mission live in the residence halls? So it's it's really all encompassing, but it's the idea that we're leading in a way um, that our actions, our values, every bit of us is focused around our mission and um, what it means to be mission-centered. It means that um, for our contemporary student body, in all ways, whether it's the billboards you see on 94 or um, the the way that we offer um, gatherings for our alumni, in all ways, there is an invitation, um, that there is an, an opportunity, that there is a journey that we're doing this together um, through the very best Benedictine practice. We wanted to make sure that all of this work has that focus. So that's that's the first and um, the second around the fiscal and operational excellence, you know, I, I would say I would go back to the word thrive um, that that to really have um, a sophisticated, um, all encompassing institution on both campuses it means we're thriving. It means that we're known for best practice. It means that we um, have innovated with our academics. It means um, all of those things because um, we have to have our fiscal stability to thrive. That's just, that's the reality. And um, a large part of that, of course, is our enrollment um, and having consistent study enrollment. The, the last piece um, around student and student experience, um, for those of you that don't know, I began my career in higher education as a dean of students. And so I always have in, in my heart um, students and student needs. And what I love about just the boldness of, of that specific area is the idea that we are best in class 
that we really are exceptional in all areas, that we're not the institution that you say, oh, well, if you want to study uh, history, you go there. Oh, well, if you want to play this sport, you go there. No, that you come and you're a Benny and you're a Johnny because of all of it. And in its totality, it is such an exceptional experience. We prepare you um, to address, I think that our vision statement, Richard, for the plan is um, preparing our, our students in it with a preeminent experience. Um, so they're able to mm -hmm. take on the most um, trying problems of our world. I can't imagine um, parents looking for an institution for children could argue with that. Sounds like a, a pretty good initiative to me. <laughs> No, I think it's I think it's so true. And we see that I mean my experience in over 16 plus years is that our graduates are the ones who are, you know, they're active in their communities. Yes. They are not afraid of a problem, they, but they come to it with a positivity and a solution. Um, mm -hmm. they're willing to be in they're willing to engage with one another and and be known for that and That's truly right. selling that. That is not a given at every institution or every experience and not a given with every college graduate. And so it is, I think, one of the things that's really terrific about this plan. So, um, you know, but again, we are very specifically, though our student experience writ large is absolutely so meaningful. We are still very much an, 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 an academic institution that is focused with what we do in the classroom. So Richard, can you tell us a little bit about how this plan connects to our ongoing academic improvements, and our long-standing tradition of academic rigor. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, and I also want to say um, also that uh, working with Kara is also helping me uh, through this, this plan. It's great to have a partner who's walking right alongside of you, and it's great to have a partner who is looking at both institutions instead of one or the other institution. Uh, as you know, I've been uh, here before talking about uh, some of the changes in the uh, academic area. And certainly um, last year when I was here, we were talking about some of the prioritization that we had had to do. But this is ongoing with this idea of academic innovation. And in fact, one of the initiatives is academic innovation. That particular initiative is co-chaired with me and the chair of the faculty assembly, uh, Carrie Hoover, and we are pulling together a team of faculty and staff. And we've actually got several teams working on different kinds of innovations that, that uh, we think will play to our strengths. But this group is also working with, as you mentioned a second ago, Heather, your group with partnerships, knowing that partnerships become a part of academic innovation, also working with uh, the initiative that's looking at uh, the enrollment, uh, strategic enrollment plan, as well as a few other initiatives. Uh, but I can tell you right now, we are looking at what are new programs we could be looking at and what are some ways we can innovate some of the programs we currently have in, in uh, making them more cross-disciplinary. We're looking at some new centers and developing new centers. Right now, there are five of them that we're focused on. One of them is uh, Center for the Environment, uh, Center for Health and Wellness, uh, Teaching and Learning Center, which we already have, but uh, we need to focus on uh, how to uh, uh, get more resources to that center, which is also going to be focusing on academic innovations, principled business leadership, and the Center in the Humanities and Liberal Arts. We already have faculty leading each of these centers right now and pulling together groups of faculty to help us uh, figure out what the focus of each of these centers can be uh, mo moving forward. And one other that I would point out is equitable access um, and participation in high impact practices. That's mm -hmm. another initiative that we're looking at. For, uh, for those of you who may not know what a high impact practice is, uh, high impact practices are those practices that are inside and outside the classroom that we know have long lasting effects on students, but also help with uh, student engagement. Uh, three of them that we're focusing on, internships, 
study abroad experience and undergraduate research. Uh, and we believe that we can look at these and figure out, are we being equitable? What students are being left behind who are not participating in these high impact practices? And we're also looking at helping faculty and staff design, implement, and manage high impact practices embedded in their courses and in their departments and in their, their programs for students. So those are a few of the ways that we're move, continuing to move forward with the academic innovations. We know that high impact practices are one, they're a huge part of, of what, we've, what we're known for really, but also we know that engaged students tend to be great em engaged employees, right, as well. I mean, the Gallup yes. research is really clear in that space. And we're doing amazing work in this space. I mean, we just won, if I remember, a national award on undergraduate research. Yes. Um, and yes. for our viewers, when you get a chance to watch this episode, I'll encourage you to look at the last issue of the magazine where we really featured on all of those areas that um, run out of the Experience Hub, um, mm -hmm. which is where we center all of those, along with the Fleischacker Center, you know, for Ethical Leadership in Action, um, which in part, about, um, funds a large number of our summer fellows, which is a, a way that we've made some of our high impact practices more accessible by funding. Yes. We know there's so much more opportunity to continue this kind of work. So it's really exciting what we're doing there. Mm -hmm. So again, we are so student focused um, in everything we do. It's central um, to the work at St. Ben's and St. John's. So how does this plan do that? Keep the student at the center but also position us as forward-thinking, moving institutions of higher education. How does this plan give us a competitive edge in the marketplace while still remaining mission and student-focused? Kara, tell us how we're doing it. Okay. Uh, well, I, I would just say that um, both campuses are so eager to do that very work. Yes, we know um, we are really good for students and students feel it. We know that in our retention rates, um, one of the nation's highest, we know that in our graduation rates, um, we know that in our alumni giving. Um, once you're a student, once you're a Benny, once you're a Johnny, you you um, appreciate that and you stay for that. The question always is, how do you get more? How do we find more students? And particularly in this um, demographic. So while we're working hard on really being best in class with the student experience, the other side of the house is working really hard on um, not only regaining some market share that we've lost in the last two, three years, um, right around the COVID period, but also expanding some of our market share. And um, the reason that we know we can do that is a really great research um, that helps us understand those high impact practices um, they're not common everywhere. We have to share those stories. We have to have our bennies tell um, young women about the power of being at a women's institution. All of those things. I will say to you, Heather, um, when it came to the point of ranking all of our priorities in our strategic plan, um, the number one priority across all demographics, um, the monasteries, alums, students, parents, faculty, staff was telling the CSB SJU story. Um, if I've heard that once, I've heard it a hundred times. Me there's a frustration, mm -hmm. there, there's a frustration mm -hmm. that, that um, we aren't um, in the spotlight, that we aren't well known um, for the incredible outcomes that, that we have. And that to me is just so thrilling because we have so much to work with. I mean, we have amazing outcomes. We have beautiful campuses. We have accomplished alums. And um, that has to be a priority to, to share the, the benefits of coming. We've just spent about six months um, reorganizing, doing a complete reorg of our marketing 
PR um, and communication office and function. We have um, some really incredible talent um, that has joined us to begin to help us craft that story in a, a much more, again, there's that word strategic um, way, but also in a way that um, we know the contemporary student needs it and needs to hear it. Um, it's it's much less transactional. Um, higher ed used to be, you send us your um, transcripts and your application and we'll send you back if we want you and then you send us back money and then you can come. Um, it, it is so far from that now. Uh, we have students that really want a personal journey. They want a sincere relationship with their institution. They want to feel um, valued, understandably, but that calls for some unique marketing, some unique positioning. I think that you'll um, start to hear us on um, some maybe um, pretty reputable stations. I think you'll start to see us um, on social media a little bit differently. And that's all about the contemporary student demographic. You, you'll hear frequently people say, well, I don't, I don't really like the way we do this or I don't like it. And I, and I always try to very gently say, oh, okay, but that's not for you. That's for the 17, 18, 19 year old student that has grown up um, living on devices and the way they receive their information is, is far different than um, we did even five, seven, 10 years ago. So we're working fast and furiously on that. I'm excited for a July 1 launch of a new website. Um, we're excited for some rebranding. Um, we're excited for some real defined um, brand guidelines and style guidelines. Athletics is gonna have a little bit of a, a new look. And um, that's that's an exciting time for us. I will um, tell you that it has been um, one of the hardest pieces is getting all the threads together to understand all the unique ways we need our story told. Um, but I think that our alumni will be really impressed. And I think that they'll start to see and, and kind of feel the, the different way that we're telling our story. I will say to our alums, I think you'll be able to see that in some of the communication from us, but really the, the, the really powerful stuff, unless you are a 16, 15, <laughs> yeah. 14, you know, to 18 year old prospective student or the parent of one or a member of the family, you might not see everything. So I really encourage you to ask those prospective students in your life if they're seeing St. Ben's and St. John's show up in their social media feeds as well. I highly encourage you to do that because I think sometimes we hear from folks too say, I never see us. I don't know that we're out there. You might not be in our algorithm and that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be. That um, is very true. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a really good point. Um, I, I will also say that, that we have work to do internally in terms of our communication. And we know that from all the data that, that we gathered um, and, and we're launching that too. And so our hope is that there will be alums, uh, alumni that, that do see some of the kind of new look and new feel, but most importantly, um, we, we need to grow that large number of inquiries that we get for every first year class. Um, our class size has to be over 400. We want to thrive, remember, not just exist. Both St. Ben's and St. John's, so a total That's of 800. Exactly right. A total of 800 um, first year students. And um, we're determined that um, we're going to do it. And, and we know we can um, based on the data that, that we've really worked hard to collect. That's right. So Richard, one of the unique features of the plan is that really intentional focus on um, how we work together collaboratively. So how are we building together using our strengths while also honoring the institution's individual uniqueness? Um, this is, I think, an intentional, um, this is like an intentional introduction to the concept of strong integration at St. Ben's and St. John's at a really, really important time. So Say more about how strong integration is working and really making this plan work on both campuses. Yeah, that's a good good question. Uh, first off, strong integration isn't an end state, it's a process. So 
So I want everybody to realize <laughs> that it's a process and it's ongoing. Um, Kara just mentioned all the things that she's working on right now and changing. So she has had to do a heroic job of pulling things together, sorting things out, uh, talking about new ways of doing things, as well as continuing doing things uh, the way that we have been accustomed to. So it takes a while for all of all of that uh, to happen, but we're already seeing that success in the strategic plan. Uh, I'm seeing people working together and, and not just across the two campuses. So one of the parts of strong integration I think people forget is it also for my job integrated academic affairs and student development together, right? And so we are meeting as a leadership team, the deans in uh, student development and the associate provost there and the associate provost and the deans academic affairs meeting together, talking about what we're trying to accomplish and how we're moving forward. I think one of the key initiatives, the mental health initiative that I just talked about a minute ago is in fact one of those initiatives that everybody across both of these areas that have now come together know that they have to work on together. So uh, I'm seeing that that happen. And one of the initiatives that I think we're really seeing this happen is the development of a unified uh, facilities master plan. That is key. We have never had a unified facilities master plan. And as the provost, it was sometimes a challenge going back and forth between the two campuses to decide which department goes where and what resources are going from that university or college to that particular facility. That was an inefficient way to do things because we had a lot of duplication. And now we can say, wait a minute, what are the strongest parts of each of the campuses and how do we how do we leverage those and how do we use those in a meaningful meaningful way and how do we leverage all of these resources that we have student tuition as well as uh, endowment funds and gifts how do we use that as, as good stewards and one way to use it as good stewards is make sure that we have this unified master plan so that we are working together and, and using our resources in um, in a way that is is helping all of our our students. And I think Richard, three of the things I mean, that kind of the three things you sort of talked about actually also identify where in having a conversation about it together actually serves not only both of us together better, but actually individually the campuses and the students at each as well. Um, and what I mean by that is if thinking about, you know, having a conversation about mental health for various reasons that are way that are not necessarily about genetics and are a heck of a lot more about environment, men are using mental health services differently than our women are and for different reasons. Right. And we're able to talk right. about that intentionally and together making sure that we have the right mix of mental health providers, yeah. that we're doing the right things from an intervention standpoint. John Andrick was that with us in our last um, St. Ben's at Home. And he just touched on this really briefly um, as we are really looking at the challenges around men across the country, even attending college, let alone mm -hmm. graduating. Um, so it's just mm -hmm. like one example. But also, care if you want to talk a little bit about our facilities. Part of the challenge around our facilities is the colleges actually have a very different structure on ownership of our facilities. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think a lot of folks don't really know that about St. Ben's and St. John's. Sure. Um, and and I, I think that that's about, um, Heather, to answer one of your questions, honoring um, each campus. It, they're, it's not one campus. There are two different campuses. And I have to share, I overheard um, some Bennies and Johnnies talking one day and um, the the Benny said, well, everybody wants to go to the St. John's campus because you guys have the lake. And the, the Johnny said, well, everybody wants to go to the St. Ben's campus because you guys have the town. And I thought it was so funny that 
um, you know, they they saw that in competition. And um, all of the work that we're talking about and that President Brees is, is leading is about seeing it's not either or, it's and um, to, to really honor. And so I, I think to, to answer your, your question just specifically about the facilities, there are facilities on each campus that are gorgeous and beautiful. Um, and the question is, how do we use those best? Um, how do we highlight why they're meaningful, the architecture or the artifacts or um, the history of the space? And we, we can do that singularly, but we can also do that together. So this joint master plan I think is is helping us again prioritize what are those spaces that we honor, um, and what are the spaces that we don't need two of, um, and how how do we do that? Because that's part part again of, of the resources and managing resources. Um, operating two of everything is expensive, um, so so we're sorting that out, and it's been um, a pleasure to watch um, people get to know each other campus. You know, maybe they aren't familiar with one campus or, or the other campus. And when you see things with new eyes, you always um, see things really with a lot of possibilities. And so that that has been, um, I think, very, very encouraging. So Kara, another really unique feature of this um, is the external focus of this plan. That's great. Right. Full of community partnerships, external relationships, alum engagement at every level of the institutions. So I kind of have two questions for you here. What makes community partnerships so important to St. Ben's and St. John's right now? And because our audience always wants to know and, and alums, you know, want to know how they can help and how can they help and participate in the strategic plan? Yes. Um, well, you know, I, I would tell you the the idea around partnerships, external partnerships, partnerships that honor um, the high impact impact practices that that Provost Ice was just referring to are essential for the future of higher education institutions. Um, the the days are gone that um, the academy decides what they're going to um, teach and then industry or business or technology, they're just going to get those graduates and figure out um, what they know and, and what they don't know. And um, we know that liberal arts institutions that thrive, not, not just survive, that thrive are institutions that are able to marry in a really, I'm going to say it again, strategic way, um, industry needs, business needs with what your student is doing in the classroom, um, that those lines of inquiry are really fluid between real life application and then that beautiful liberal arts um, uh, nuance that each of our students get in the classroom. Without those, those real life partnerships, um, the education of a student in 2024 is far too isolating, um, is far too impractical, and it puts uh, our students at a disadvantage. The other piece about it is part of telling that story, the exposure to critical partners, um, the exposure to really um, bright innovations that are happening is important for the external world to see us as thought leaders, as best practice partners, as researchers, as developers, all of those things. We can't do that in isolation either. Um, we have to be able to really be the go-to college and university, um, not just locally, nationally, and hopefully globally, that um, we are seen as the thought leaders in you name it. Is it in environment? What are the centers? You know, is it in environmental sustainability? Is it in political engagement? Is it how to um, best figure out the ways that we care for um, women in rural areas? What whatever it is, um, those partnerships uber essential and no pressure, Heather, because I know that you're leading. <laughs> you're leading 
leading that effort. Okay, I have a, I have a village. I have a whole team. We're all in this together, really. You do. So I know that our alums are super invested in engaging. You, so you do. Well, as well as our partners. People it's want to partner with us. We are good partners. Yes. So if you've got ideas, you all have my email. Please send them my way. It's true. We we are we are good partners, and and mm -hmm. I would also say all of the academic innovations that Richard is leading right now, from graduate programs to certificate programs, um, those those are best done in conjunction with either a certain discipline or a certain entity. Um, for a couple of reasons, one, it's a great pipeline of students um, from a, a certain uh, discipline. And lots of employers um, want to offer that benefit to their their um, employee. And the other reason that it's it's important as we grow our, our disciplines is because the back to life learner. Um, I think the average is everyone is going to have seven jobs in their lifetime. So the students that we we graduate this year, um, the data shows that they over their lifetime they'll have seven different jobs. And so we have to be able to accommodate that and, and, and keep up with that. Um, the last bit about partnerships that is critical, crucial um, for our alumni is to know that we there's, there's no partnership too small, um, no partnership too big, and we need their thoughts and we need their leadership and their innovation and their connections, even if it's just a door that you can open for us. Um, if you Beautiful. know that we could partner, um, we we need you. We need you on the ground and, and helping us out. Such a great. And I, I would also add, you know, uh, we at St. Ben's and St. John's have always thought of our liberal arts education as liberal arts in action. Mm -hmm. That it's not just uh, thinking about ideas, but it's acting on those ideas and taking them out to a broader society and to to, to your local communities. So the high impact practices are going to be uh, essential for these partnerships. We have to have the partnerships, but we also have to take that liberal arts education uh, and put it, put it into action. You know, one specific example of that, Richard, um, is our narrative practice program. So it's a new academic yes. area for us that stems from, from an English professor from our English department, classic mm -hmm. liberal arts. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with the program, we have almost 100 students annually um, out working with patients, mostly in the center care health system, which is our local system here, um, working with patients at risk of delirium. So people who are um, undergoing major surgeries, um, dementia, and our students are helping them tell their stories mm -hmm. and yes. taking that in the classroom. And in doing so, increasing the health outcomes for those individual patients. The health system is benefiting. Again, those, those health outcomes are increased and our students are getting to be better writers, better listeners. And again, I mean, Benedict's rule starts with listen. I just can't think of a better example. And that only works because center care trusts us and works with us and our faculty to let our students come in mm -hmm. and work with some of their most at-risk patients. I mean, that really is the liberal arts in action. Yes, right. yes. So we're getting to the end of our time. Um, and so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask you all um, just really quickly, Kara, it's a really bold plan. Um, so how, you know, how do we think, um, well, actually, you've actually answered one of the questions we had was really about the brand and how we'll, we'll tell that story. So I'm actually going gonna, gonna to switch gears a little bit here and we're going to go into a lightning round. So oh I'm going to ask a question and each of you get to give a very short answer. Okay. So, all right. First question. What is your favorite initiative in the strategic plan? Carrie, you get to go first. Telling the CSBSJU story. Great. Richard, your favorite? Academic innovation. You're picking the one that you like to. I like partnerships, but I will say I'm I'm a big fan of telling the story as well. So, um, all right, Richard, you start this time. Which one initiative is the most pressing or urgent in your opinion? Um, I'm going to hedge on this one because <laughs> I don't think it's an initiative. I think it's what's the most important 
is the enrollment key performance indicator. That guides all of the decisions on all of the initiatives. Kara, how about you? You know, I rarely do this, but I'm going to 100% agree <laughs> with Provost I. <laughs> <laughs> I give him a hard time as much as I can, but, um, <laughs> you know, Provost, Provost Dice is right. And, and I'm going to, I, I know I'm on repeat, but the difference between surviving and thriving, um, is enrollment. Enrollment is critical for the level of vitality on campus, for the number of graduates you have out in the field, um, for our campuses to, um, use all of the resources well, so it, it's it's got to be that consistent, thriving enrollment. All right. So the last question, um, Carol, that you have first crack at this question. Okay. Um, Richard, you can answer if you'd like. So how are we going to know that this plan was successful at the end? Um, that's so interesting that you asked that because so many people have said that to me. Well, how do you know? And how do you da 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 da? Um, I think that it is um, having a runway. Um, and when, when I say that, for us to be able to be at the end of the runway and look back and say, oh, wait, we have had steady upward trends in enrollment. Oh, wait, we have had uh, our employee turnover be zilch. Um, oh, wait, we have had increased participation in high prep high impact practices oh, yeah we have had a new look and a new website and so it's it's really accomplishing all of those things um that that lead to a thriving institution and um that again is that steady upward trend in our enrollment number right well, i'm gonna let you have the last word there um, thank you, Richard, Kara. Um, the strategic plan is ambitious. It's bold and courageous. Um, and it is our next step um, on our journey of strong integration. Um, so I think at that, um, we just thank everyone um, who watches this after the fact. And if you have any questions about this plan, we do encourage you to send those to us. Um, and Marsha, with that, I will leave it to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, uh, Richard, Kara, and Heather for your time and, and incredible information this evening. We very much appreciate it. Please visit the strategic planning website noted on screen for more information about any of the plans and initiatives that you've heard about tonight. And you can see the website in front of you. This concludes tonight's episode of St. Ben's at Home. Please check out all our past episodes of St. Ben's at Home on our website. And the series will return again in the fall of 2024. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night.